A few questions came up recently about instruction in God's Word and what about the times when God doesn't say not to? What about when God is silent about certain things, when uh, certain things are not specifically condemned outright in the inspired text of King Jesus? How do we approach those situations and those subjects? Because as we look at some of the logic that has been used in times past, and we apply it to the way things are kind of being done today, it doesn't always fit anymore. It used to be, especially when I was a child, if I was sent to a grocery store and told to pick up certain things and had the right amount of money you know, to get those things, maybe a little extra money, that if I decided while I was there on my own to pick some of those, some extra things up, when I got home, I would be in a world of hurt because I didn't have permission or authority to pick up those things. And most of us probably understand that a little bit, but maybe for some of those younger of us, doesn't sound like, well, what's, what's the big deal? Because m- maybe going to the store and picking up a little something extra, grabbing something for yourself, there were no consequences. A lot of times in our world, in our society, especially today, there aren't a lot of consequences for things that that people do that either they they shouldn't do or they just assume, well, they didn't say not to. And so they think everything is going to be all right. And so sometimes the logic that we would have used in times past is not something that is helpful in looking at and approaching some subjects Today, of course, one thing that hasn't changed is God's Word. And when we talk about this particular subject, what we're talking about is authority, Bible authority. And so we want to know what does God say about something or what is pleasing to God or what can we do that that we know God is going to be happy with or pleased with How do we know what the work of the church is and what we can do as a congregation? How do we know that we can't have Coke and pizza for the Lord's Supper or donuts and coffee for the Lord's Supper? How do we know that we are to sing and not have instruments when it comes to our music in worship? How do we know those things when specifically those things are not said, you shall not? And I think most of us understand some of these principles probably very clearly, but there have been some questions recently is why I want to cover this again, because every once in a while it's good to go back and by way of reminder. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17, and this is where we will start. Colossians 3 verse 17, he tells us in this particular text, as Paul is writing by inspiration of King Jesus, that whatsoever you do in word and deed... Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to the Father through Him. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in His name. In other words, do all by His authority. If you want to speak, you want to act, especially in, 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 in particularly in religious matters, you need authority for those things. Now, We can talk about where authority comes from, and we'll get into that. Obviously, I think we understand it's the Word of God in and of itself. This is what gives us authority. Jesus had made the argument, John's baptism, was it from God or from man? Those are our two choices. And so if we're going to do things with the authority of Christ, it must be from Him. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. In 1 Peter 4 and verse 11, he says, If any man speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. And so if someone asks you a question, if someone asks me a question, can we do this or can we do that? Why can't we do this or that? Then the the idea is going to be what my response is. My answer has to come from the Word of God. If you're going to seek instruction or answers about God and about what is pleasing to Him, what you find must come from His Word. That's what Peter is telling us. 
in 1 Peter 4 and verse 11. If you're going to speak, speak as the oracles of God. 2 John verses 9 and 10. Whosoever abideth not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. Whoever abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. And so we see clearly that, that abiding in what has been revealed is how we know we have God and are with Christ Jesus. Abiding in those things. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, he tells us, do not go beyond what is written. Or don't think of men above what is written. And the point is, what is written? That's, the, that's what is being focused upon here. What has been revealed. Too often we want to know about things that have not been revealed. When God is telling us in His Word, we need to be focused on what has been revealed. Even in the Great Commission of Matthew chapter 28, as you look at verse 20, after he says in verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. He says in verse 20, Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Teach them to observe the things I have commanded. What about what the things that he hasn't commanded? Or even has not specifically outright condemned? Well, what does he say? He says, we're to teach that which he has commanded, that we're to observe what he has commanded. And I think these passages are extremely clear. And I think those who are honest and desiring to simply please God understand these passages. As one old preacher used to tell me, if you can see through a ladder, you can see this. Well, the problem now becomes people want to muddy the water. They want to come along and they want to make arguments and they want to raise doubt and, and questions and you know, saying things like, you know, God didn't say not to. You know, so what about this? Or, you know, why not that? It's not specifically condemned. And of course, there's always the approach husbands use for their wives. It's easier to get forgiveness than permission, right? But that doesn't work with God. You know, in trying to make more arguments, well, it was okay in the Old Testament. They did it back then. Why can't we do it now? They, they did things that God w was accepting of and, and allowed, even though He didn't specifically condemn and, or just they, they go back to the Old Testament. And I grant to you that there are certain things in the Old Testament that God allowed that He did not like. In fact, Jesus pointed that very thing out. And he also says why. In Matthew chapter 19, in a discussion concerning marriage and divorce, in Matthew chapter 19, when Jesus was asked, is it lawful to divorce for any reason? He says, have you not read? In the beginning God made them male and female. And for this reason, a man should leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, that they shall no longer be two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. And they, they understood his answer, but they were trying to trip him up. They were trying to catch him in something. They say, well, wait a minute. Why then did Moses allow for writing a certificate of divorcement? And notice what he says in verse 8. Because of the hardness of your hearts, Moses certainly allowed for the writing of a certificate of divorcement. But from the beginning, it was not so. You know, we want to look back and say, well, listen, it was allowed under the Old Testament. There were certain things that we learn God kind of overlooked. Even in Acts 17, 30, God, these times of ignorance God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Here, Jesus is telling us, listen, there were things that God had allowed because He had a plan. He had a purpose to bring about a Messiah, a Christ, for salvation of the world. 
And because he wanted to fulfill that plan and, and it was going to be done through the tribe of Judah, and, and you know, we, we can go through all of that history if we want. But he points out basically here in Matthew chapter 19, listen, he, he allowed for that because of the hardness of your hearts. That's a huge contrast to what he expects of us as his children today and the salvation that we have as his children today. Is God pleased with us acting through the hardness of hearts? I would say not. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through, through 24, he talks about having our heart right, our heart sprinkled and purified. And so, no, He wants us to have our hearts right. He wants to cure the heart problem that they had under the old law and in the Old Testament. And so our hearts are to be right with God now. Not to act through hard-heartedness or through selfishness. Because isn't that where a lot of this stems from? Because of the things that we're trying to justify, trying to authorize, trying to accept and engage in because we want it, we like it, we think it's better, we think it would work, we think it's all about us rather than God. But let's think about God's approach, even in the Old Testament to begin with. Granted, there were some things that because of the hardness of their hearts, which obviously, as we pointed out, God is not willing to accept hard-heartedness in His children today under the new covenant. But that wasn't with everything under the old law. There were some principles, some, some, some uh, things that we see in God's approach. Genesis chapter 4, for example. Remember Cain and Abel, they offered sacrifices. Both of them offered sacrifices. But as we're told in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, Abel offered his sacrifice by faith. And remember, faith comes by hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, verse 17. You know, faith comes by the Word of God, from instruction of God. It was by faith that he did that. And the implication is that what Cain did was not by faith. And God was not pleased. He was pleased with Abel because it was according to what had been revealed. He was not pleased with Cain because it was according to what had not been revealed. And that's important for us to, to grasp and understand when we look at even things in the New Testament. But continuing in the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. In Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, you've got the, the, the sons of Aaron acting as, as priests, and here they were offering, uh, Nadab and Abihu, offering strange fire. They had gotten an unauthorized fire. They were a little presumptuous in what they had done, getting it from somewhere God had not instructed them to get it. And at that time, God had not said Thou sh and, and list everywhere, thou shalt not get fire from here, from here, from here. He didn't have to. And we see that they were consumed by fire because of their sin. Moses, I, a great man of faith. In Exodus chapter 17... In verse 6, after leading the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage, uh, here they were going out into the wilderness, and, and all the children of Israel did was complain. Moan and whine and just, you know, oh, did you bring us out in the wilderness to die? Were there not enough graves back in Egypt? We're hungry. We have no food, and God sent manna. Here they are, we're thirsty, there's nothing to drink. God instructs Moses in Exodus chapter 17 and in verse 6, Go and strike this rock, and it will yield forth its waters. And Moses did just exactly as he had been told by God. And it worked. Everything was good. 
But that was really towards the beginning of that exodus. That, you know, that, this, was, this, was, this wasn't towards the end. We have another occasion in the book of Numbers, chapter 20, where at, towards the end of their wandering. Again, the people are whining, they're moaning, and they're, you know, they, they don't like the situation they find themselves in. In Numbers chapter 20, again, they're thirsty. They want something to drink. God tells Moses, I want you to go and speak to the rock. And Moses, in his frustration, I'm sure, with all that has been going on with the children of Israel, they're whining, they're moaning and complaining just over and over again. Everything that he's had to deal with with those people in rejecting God and other instructions. Moses steps up to the rock and he strikes it. In fact, he struck it twice. Here's an interesting th- fact that the water did in fact come out of the rock. It, the rock yielded forth its water. However, because of what the Bible says is Moses' unbelief, his disregard for God's instruction, he was not allowed to enter into the promised land. Why? I mean, the the water came out of the rock. That's what they wanted. I think, first of all, it shows us the ends do not justify the means. God gave instruction on what Moses was to do, and Moses took it upon himself to do it another way. God, at this point in time, in Numbers chapter 20, says, Now listen, don't strike the rock. Just speak to the rock. It's not what he said. He said, don't do what I told you back in Exodus chapter 17, verse 6, when we were coming out of Egypt. Don't do that. I want you to do this. No, he simply said, go and speak to the rock. There was a time when God had told Moses to strike the rock, and now there's a time when he tells him, I want you to speak to the rock. And when Moses decided to do what he did the first time, God was not pleased. In 1 Chronicles chapter 17, we just talked about this on our Wednesday night class when Russell was uh, going through David and the character of David. In in 1 Chronicles chapter 17, verses 1 through 6, David comes to Nathan and he he talks about building a, a, a temple for God. And at first, Nathan said, yeah, that's a, man, that sounds like a great idea. Go, do it. And then God comes to Nathan. He says, no, wait a minute. Why did you tell him to do that? I, you know. And he pointed out to Nathan, did I speak a word concerning this? I didn't say to do this. Now, he goes on and said, listen, David, you know what? I'm going to allow the temple to be built, and you're going to have the plans. You'll know all about it, but you're not going to do it. That just goes to show that God truly does listen to us. He, 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 you know, prayer can be a powerful thing, no doubt. But God gives a cautionary note here and said, listen, I didn't say anything about this. You don't go and act on your own. You do need authority before you act. If you're going to be be pleasing to me. Folks, that's just the Old Testament. When we come to the New Testament, what we're going to find is much of the same. Jesus Himself, remember who Jesus is. Not just the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, but Jesus is high priest and king. But remember, He is from Judah. And that's important. When you look at His lineage... In the beginnings of Matthew and and the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke, what you find is very specifically that as was promised from Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, and David, 
that the, that the lineage, the seed that was promised to Abraham would come through them, through Judah. And remember, to be a priest under the old law, there is something specific. You had to be of Levi, and more specifically, to be a high priest, you had to be a descendant of Aaron, neither of which was Jesus. And so in Hebrews chapter 7, in talking about Jesus being both priest and king, he says by necessity there had to be a change in the law. But notice verse 14. He says there concerning a priest from Judah, Moses said nothing. He was silent on this. He didn't reveal anything. He, he, he wasn't, you cannot... It was just under the old covenant to be a priest, you had to be a descendant of Levi. To be high priest, you had to be direct descendant of Aaron. And because Jesus was both priest and king by necessity, there had to be a change of the law. A new covenant needed to be ushered into place. And in that new covenant, we have a plan of salvation through Christ Jesus and His blood. And that plan of salvation is all about not only hearing and believing and confessing our faith, but repenting of our sins and being immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins. But then there were some who were troubling the churches. In Acts chapter 15, some had come out of Jerusalem, they had gone to Antioch and and were traveling around, and they were teaching that in order to be saved, you had to be circumcised. And so if the Gentiles wanted wanted salvation through Christ Jesus, they needed first to proselyte to Judaism through circumcision, and then they could be saved through Christ Jesus. And there was a huge debate when Paul and Barnabas and and others heard about this, like, "What, what, what is this? What is this teaching? This isn't right. Like, well, these men are from Jerusalem. That's where the the apostles are at, including Peter and James and John. And and they've said they've come from there. And they're teaching this. And so Paul and others go to Jerusalem to ask about this. And there was no small debate. They discussed it. Seems as though they argued about it just a little bit. But ultimately, I want you to notice the conclusion that is given from our scripture reading this morning in Acts chapter 15 and in the latter part of verse 24, talking about this circumcision, talking about what these men had come and teaching. And notice he says, We gave them no instruction, or as some translations say, We gave them no such command. We were silent on this. We didn't tell them to teach that. Now it's obvious through the debate that they had, they never did say, you shall not teach circumcision or any other parts of the old law. Because this was such a huge point of contention and controversy, we do have a letter that Paul wrote, uh, not only in Colossians but mainly Galatians, that condemns this very thing. In fact, Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, he he deals with this and he tells them, I marvel you have turned so quickly from Him who called you into grace to another gospel, which is not another. Some have troubled you. And they, of course, they were teaching circumcision. And he tells them, listen, if anyone... Even an angel from heaven comes to you and brings to you something other than what has been delivered. Let them be accursed. In other words, if we've been silent on something and they want to kind of maybe fill in a blank or something, that's not what we've delivered. Let them be accursed. that's, That's not what God's will is. That's not what we should be doing. It's not what we should be practicing. And so ultimately we ask the question, what does God want? In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, in verses 11 and 12, who can know 
what is in the, the, the heart of a man unless the Spirit of the man reveals it to you. We have the Spirit of God. We have the mind of God because the Spirit of God has revealed it to us. This is what He wants. And we can make all kinds of applications from here. Why do we do the Lord's Supper every first day of the week? Because God has revealed to us. For example, in Acts chapter uh, chapter 20 and verse 7, that upon the first day of the week, disciples came together to break bread. On the first day of the week, 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2, they were commanded to lay by in store, to give a free will offering. Why do we have unleavened bread and fruit of the vine? Because Jesus took unleavened bread and fruit of the vine and instituted the Lord's Supper in Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 28. And they followed that as we have read this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 34. And so we have His instruction. He didn't have to say, don't do all of these things. Remember in the last uh, chapter of the Gospel of John, when it said all the things that Jesus did are not written in these books because the the world couldn't hold them? Can you imagine if they also tried to include all the thou shalt nots that people want to demand in order to condemn something? What we need to focus on, and if we're truly desiring to please God, we'll simply look at what God says He wants. He says He wants us to sing to one another. Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in our hearts to the Lord. That's what we do. Meet on the first day of the week. That's what we do. To have the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. That's what we do. Unleavened bread and fruit of the vine. That's what we do. To give a free will offering. And not have fundraisers or bake sales because of the instruction we do have. God doesn't have to say thou shalt not because He's told us what He wants. And simply sticking with that not only should be good enough for us, but we need to understand that that's that's what God wants us to do. We get this mindset, bigger is better. Such grand and great things, that's such a carnal mindset. We need to be focused on spiritual things, on God and His Word. Nothing more, certainly nothing less. And in that Word, He told us what we must do to be saved. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. If you're here this morning and you haven't done that, God is pleading you not to follow any other instruction, any other doctrine or teaching that contradicts or denies the plain word revealed to us, but to submit yourself humbly, repenting of your sins, being immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins, rising to walk in newness of life. As a child of God, if you sin and fallen short, pray God to forgive you. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, He is faithful and just to forgive you. And the blood of Christ will cleanse you. But make your life right with the Lord. Become a child of His. And if we can help you with that, please don't delay. Come to the front as together we stand and sing.